Well, welcome to the uh, first session for the afternoon for our conference on um, the future of healthcare in America. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to follow the following format as we did this morning, if you weren't here. Uh, what we will is we'll have a presentation by Ovik Roy. And following that, we'll have uh, Mark Hall and Tom Roberts come up and we'll have a conversation about the issues Ovik raises during his presentation. But before Ovik comes up, I, I know he's been introduced before, but just in case you weren't here, I think it's important to introduce our speakers. Um, Ovik is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. His research interests include Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, and consumer-driven health care. He is author of Apaca Theory, the, influ um, the influential floor, excuse me, Forbes blog on health care policy and entitlement reform. He writes regularly for Forbes and the National Review, and his work has also appeared in National Affairs, USA Today, The Atlantic, and The American Spectator, and other publications. And I was surprised when I met Ovik, and he was so young. <laughs> uh, he is a frequent guest on N MSNBC, C uh, NBC, Fox News, Fox Business, and HBO. In 2012, he served as an advisor to Mitt Romney campaign on health care. And when he's done, we'll have a, a couple of people come up. Mark Hall, uh, who is the Fred D. and Elizabeth T. Turnage Professor of Law at Wake Forest University School of Law. And Tom Roberts, who is an influential physician in town, and he has practiced internal medicine in Missoula for 32 years. He is the president of the Western Montana Clinic, and we'll come up after Ovik is done and have a conversation about these interesting issues that he raises. So thank you, Ovik. Please welcome him. Well, thanks for having me here. Um, it's great to be here in Montana. I live in the financial district of New York, where I rarely get to see grass and trees and sky. So uh, it's great to be up here. The last time I was in Montana was two years ago. I was here for, uh, to celebrate Fourth of July with a couple of friends who live in, uh, in northern Montana. And we, so we were staying at the Whitefish Lodge. And I, I remember very well, we were sitting in the jacuzzi after a long day of hiking. And there's a big sign next to the jacuzzi saying, no drinking in the jacuzzi. But you know, they're, they're, they're the waitress was around serving food and stuff, and we really wanted to have some champagne to celebrate Fourth of July. And so one of my friends said, Can we, "Would you please, to the waitress, would you please let us, uh, you know, have a glass of wine uh, here in the jacuzzi?" And so she takes one look to her left and one look to her right, says, "Okay, fine." You know, and that would never happen in New York City. She'd be terrified of getting sued. So, you know, I always have a soft spot for Montana. It's you know, you live in a free, a free country over here, and you know, I, I really appreciate that. So I'm going to, uh, to give my uh, talk today about the conservative case for universal coverage, which uh, may seem like an oxymoron or confusing, and I will try to explain why it's not. And it's not merely, uh, don't, don't uh, feel bad if you're confused, because I think I confuse a lot of my fellow conservatives when I, when I give these kinds of remarks. But uh, I'm very convinced of this fact, uh, that actually uh, the conservative health care agenda should revolve around covering everybody. And as I mentioned in the last session, it's important for us to remind ourselves that the Affordable Care Act does not cover everybody. We, a lot of us think of it as universal coverage, but there will still be 30 million people without health insurance even after the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented. And if it's fully implemented, right? Because as you know here in Montana, not everybody wants to fully implement the law. So historically, and we, we talked a bit about this in the last session, so historically, Universal health care has been the top domestic policy priority for, for the progressive movement. It's thought of as a real core element of what, uh, what represents economic equality. You can't have, you, if, you, if you're sick and you go bankrupt because you don't have health insurance, then how can you live a, a viable life, seek a job, do all the things that people want to do? So that's been uh, the, 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 the reason why progressives and people who care about equality are so passionate about the issue of health care. And another thing that a lot of people say is, look, you can't say that it's impractical to have universal coverage because every other developed country in the world has universal coverage. So why are we the outlier? Why can't we just be like everybody else? Now the right has had a different set of policy priorities. So the conservative movement is particularly concerned about the growth of the government, particularly uh, spending, uh, not just spending, but primarily 
conservatives are concerned about the fact that the government is spending an enormous amount of money. Because at the end of the day, that money doesn't fall from the sky. It comes from taxpayers. So every dollar that's taken out of your pocket and spent by the government in an inefficient way, conservatives would argue, is money that you're not spending to do the things that you might want to do, to start a business or mow your lawn or whatever it is. That, 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 that's that, that inefficiency and also that, that limits your freedom. That's money, again, that's being taken out of your pocket and controlled by someone else instead of by you. So that's a, a fundamental conservative principle that, that has led conservatives to really resist a lot of the, uh, the uh, movements to expand government-funded and government-subsidized health care in the United States. There are also policy criticisms. So the thing you hear a lot about from conservatives is, do we really want to be like Britain and Canada, where, yeah, they have universal coverage, but you have to wait 11 months to, uh, to get, uh, have an important surgical procedure, whereas the wait times here in the US are uh, a few weeks. Do we really want that kind of system where it's hard to get a doctor's appointment, where you can't get needed care, where in the UK, if you read any uh, British newspaper, there's, you know, in every, every day there's a story about uh, discriminatory practices against the elderly. We heard about death panels and all the perhaps exaggerated rhetoric around that, but in the UK it's a serious problem where uh, ho care for the elderly is actually very, very poor. And there are headlines and uh, government officials who say things like, well, we are going to resolve not to discriminate against the elderly anymore. That's going to be our policy goal for the next several years. Uh, meaning that everyone accepts that this has been a long-standing problem because the elderly are expensive to care for. So these are things that conservatives raise as, as complaints. And another important element is that conservatives are happy with the existing system. Because if you have a job, broadly speaking, you have health insurance through your job, you're pretty satisfied with your coverage. Uh, and, and the polls show that. 88% of Americans with health coverage are satisfied with their coverage. That's why President Obama, in the campaign for the Affordable Care Act, often said, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Now, that's not a promise he necessarily kept. But it was a powerful element of the rhetorical arguments in favor of his laws that he wasn't disrupting the existing arrangements that people had. Because con the conservative constituency, which is largely people who are employed, is one in which people are like, you know what, my health care is fine, so don't mess with my health care. I'm skeptical. I don't trust you, Washington, to do anything that's going to make my health care better. You're probably going to make it worse. And there is, of course, this uh, perception on both sides, uh, conservative and liberal, that the US system is this free market system, and the European systems are these socialized systems. And that's why Europe is good, because it's universal coverage and it spends less money. And the US system is really wasteful, because we spend all this money and we don't cover everybody. So we should be more like Europe if you're uh, a progressive, and you should be less like Europe if you're a conservative, because you think, well, the American system is about freedom, and we don't want any of that European stuff. And you heard this in the campaign last year. You heard a lot of people say, well, you know, Obamacare is the, is the path towards making the U.S. like Europe. That was, that was, uh, that was what uh, uh, Governor Romney used to say. That was what uh, a lot of the, the Republican primary candidates used to say. Uh, and, and they didn't mean it in, in a flattering light. But uh, as I think uh, as, uh, you heard last night, we don't really have a free market healthcare system in America. We have this patchwork of really six different systems in America. So we have the system that we talked about before, the, uh, the employer sponsor system, which covers a lot of people. It's not exactly a free market system in this way. If you get in insurance for your employer, you didn't choose that plan. Your employer chose that plan. So that's not really free market insurance. So one thing that economists always talk about is the inefficiency of third party payment for, insur for healthcare or anything. So if you have an insurance plan and then you go to the doctor and your insurance covers everything, you have an incentive to consume more because your insurance is covering it. Now, if that's, that's called third-party payment for health care. Now, if you take into account also that we have third-party payment for health insurance. So most people in America don't get health insurance by shopping for it themselves the way they do for car insurance or homeowner's insurance or any other form of insurance. We get it from somebody else. 90% of Americans who have health insurance, somebody else picked it for them. And so that's not third-party insurance, that's ninth-party insurance. Because it's not just third-party consumption of health care, but third-party consumption of insurance. So that's, a, that's not exactly free market system, but we think of it that way because it's done through the private sector. Then there are, of course, the people who, buy, who don't get insurance through their employer, but don't get it from the government either. They buy it on the, what's called the individual or non-group market. This is a very inefficient market that has all sorts of problems. Uh, and, and, and it's, and it's uh, a big part of what uh, the Affordable Care Act tried to address. Then there's Medicare, of course, which is a single-payer system. 
there is one payer, it's the government, and sometimes the, the, the way that money flows for the system is through a contracted uh, managed care insurer. But at the end of the day, it's the government that's, that's, that's driving not only uh, the health insurance is paying for everything, it's funding everything, but also putting a lot of uh, structures around how those insurance plans, uh, what they cover, what they don't cover, et cetera. And it's that kind of patchwork system of Medicare that is a large, uh, biggest driver, or one of the biggest drivers of its inefficiency, but it is a single payer system. And Medicare is roughly one third of what we spend on healthcare in America. Uh, so it's, it's not insignificant. So this idea that we have a free market system, well, if, if one third of the system is a single payer system, and that's just Medicare, that's not exactly a free market system. Then there's Medicaid and CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is uh, a, a, a kind of a version of Medicaid for, for low-income children. That's also effectively, whoops, sorry. Well, that's also effectively a, a single-payer system. Also, again, sometimes contracted out to private insurers. But again, it's effectively single-payer health care. So those two programs are covering, by 2022, and even today, you know, a big chunk of the country. You know, 100 million people. That's not... You know, we don't have this sort of libertarian utopia free market system today in America. Then, of course, it, as the uh, Affordable Care Act gets implemented, we'll have the Affordable Care Act exchanges, which are government-subsidized uh, exchanges or marketplaces where people can shop for uh, regulated plans. So there will be plans where the government says the plan has to cover these benefits, it has to be designed in this way, and if you meet those criteria, then you can sell your insurance plan on this exchange. And based on your income level, uh, we'll give consumers a subsidy to shop for plans on that, on that market. And then there's the uninsured, which is uh, 53 million people according to the Congressional Budget Office in 2012, but will go down to 30 million in 2022 when the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented. So again, these, these, these six different ways in which people uh, get uh, coverage or don't get coverage in the case of the uninsured. Uh, interact with each other in funny ways, in very inefficient ways. And that's the really distinct thing about the U.S. system. It's not that the U.S. system is free market. It's not that the U.S. system is single payer. It has elements of both in a way that really makes no rational or policy sense. So here's an important point to consider too. So yes, we spend money on Medicare and Medicaid, quite a bit. But we also spend money on the people who get insurance through their employer. So the perception is among a lot of people in America that, well, if you get insurance for your employer, that's, you know, that's my money, right? Well, uh, what happens is because of a, uh, uh, a loophole that came out of World War II wage controls, we don't. Uh, we have actually a heavily subsidized system for employer-sponsored insurance. Uh, we talked about this again earlier, that the, that the Eisenhower administration uh, formalized this in law, but it was actually a policy that came out of World War II age era wage controls where the Roosevelt government said, well, we're going to, in order to, because all the men are off to war and the women are left and maybe some men, the labor force has basically shrunk in half or more than half, and there's going to be massive inflation as, as companies compete to hire these scarce workers. And if there's, you know, if workers are more expensive, then goods and services will be more expensive and that'll be bad for the economy. So we need to have a system of wage control. So they said a baker can only get paid this much. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a gas uh, attendant can only get paid this much. And there was this whole long list of things that people could get paid based on their profession. But health insurance didn't count under those wage controls. So if you were uh, an employer and you were competing to hire people, yes, you were capped in how much you could pay them in salary, but you weren't capped in how much you could pay them in health insurance. So people started to offer health insurance as a way of getting around government wage controls. And that's how the system we have today got started. And that is the third largest healthcare entitlement in America. It's not as big as Medicare and Medicaid, but it's almost as big. And if, and if you don't believe me, try messing with the tax deduction for employer-sponsored health insurance, and you'll get a lot of people mad at you, just as with any other entitlement. So it's not thought of as entitlement because it doesn't count as spending. It's a tax expenditure. It's done through the tax code. And so there's less revenue rather than more spending. But in effect, from a policy standpoint, it's effectively the same. And it's really important because that money is not only not taxed from an income standpoint, but it's not taxed from a payroll tax standpoint. So your FICA tax for Medicare and Social Security, uh, your, the value of your health insurance isn't taxed. So that's an incredible tax subsidy. And it's, and it's a regressive tax subsidy because wealthier people, you know, if you work for a law firm or an investment bank and you're, you're making a six-figure salary, you can have a gold-plated health insurance plan and it's completely tax-free. 
So I just, you know, I discuss why, why, this, is a, why this is a problem from a, an equity standpoint. It's also a problem from an efficiency standpoint. Because as we said, if you're not choosing your own insurance plan, you have an incentive to overconsume. Your employers have an incentive to direct more money into your health insurance plan and less money into your wages. And that means there's a lot more money flowing into the healthcare system than would ordinarily make sense. And it creates all these problems with, uh, with job lock. So if you lose your job or you want to change your job, it's very hard. It's, it, now it's, it's a little bit different today, but historically it's been very hard to change plans. And it creates all sorts of what's called friction uh, in which it's very difficult. If you want to change jobs, you're very concerned about the health coverage you're going to get at job B versus job A. Whereas if you own your own health insurance the way you do with your car insurance, we would think it, would, we would think it absurd to get car insurance through your employer. But that's exactly what we do for health care. If we got health insurance ourselves and then it was portable because we owned it, then it wouldn't matter whether we lost our job or changed jobs or took time off you know, to do whatever because that uh, health insurance plan would be owned by us. And this is the fundamental uh, principle. It's easy to waste other people's money. You know, if it's our money, we're going to be more careful of it. But when we think we have this health coverage and we don't know how much we pay for it, we don't know how much our employer pays for it, we just go to the doctor and expect to get uh, treated for everything, we have no cost sensitivity. And it's because we don't have any cost sensitivity that there's so much waste in the system. So this is the key thing. You know, again, speaking to conservatives, now, this is a slide that I always try to, to, to tell, give to the conservatives, which is, you know, conservatives like to talk about big government, how in, in, you know, incredibly important it is that we get the spending under control, we balance the budget, all this stuff. But the entirety, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office's estimates, and the Congressional Budget Office is not omniscient, but these are reasonably well vetted numbers. The y-axis on this chart is a gross domestic product, so the size of the economy. And the x-axis is the year, so it starts at 2011 and it goes to 2090 or something like that. The entirety, so this dark blue thing here at the bottom is everything other than social security and health care. So that's defense, that's food stamps, that's you know highways, everything. Education funding, it's shrinking as a share of the economy in terms of government spending. The light blue is social security, so it's staying about constant. There are problems with social security because the baby boomers are retiring and so there's less money to go around for that, that pie, but social security is not driving the deficit problems we have in America. It's all health care, Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the Affordable Care Act Exchange. Literally every dollar of growth in federal spending as a, share, uh, as a percentage of the economy is driven by health care. So we just had this big confab in Washington, the Conservative Political Action Conference you may have heard about in the news. Three-day conference, all these conservatives were there, all sorts of politicians, all the think tanks, all the activist groups, they're all gathering to talk about, you know, nursing their wounds from the November elections, et cetera, about how, what to do going forward. Three days of panels on all sorts of topics, committed to shrinking the size of government. There was not one session on health care, not one not on making the system more affordable, not on reforming entitlements, not on anything. So this is one of the problems, the intellectual blind spots of the conservative movement in my mind as a conservative, is that we talk all the time, all the time, about reducing the size of government, reducing government spending, and yet the 90-10 or the 100-0 of what drives government spending is something that we really don't pay attention to. Actually, I'm not completely telling the truth. Because interest on the debt is actually the biggest driver of our future deficits, which is, of course, driven by the health care spending. So the point is we're not going to get to 2090 on this chart, because somewhere around here, if not sooner, the rest of the world is going to stop buying gov our government debt, because they're going to say, you know what, you're broke, and you're not going to pay it back. And that's going to be a real problem. So we have to, whether you're liberal or conservative, if you're a conservative and you just philosophically believe in smaller government, you have to address this problem. If you're a liberal and you believe that healthcare spending and waste in healthcare and inefficient healthcare spending is crowding out other important progressive priorities, you need to care about this problem. It is not going away and it cannot be ignored. So let's talk about some of these other countries in the world. Let's talk about, you know, U.S. versus Europe. We've, I, I've said that you know, the U.S. system is terrible and it's not exactly some free market utopia. 
what is the United Kingdom? So the United Kingdom is a model that is kind of what, what we think of as a socialized system. So it's, it, from a purely technical standpoint, it is socialized. The government controls everything. The government owns the hospitals. The government, by and large, employs the physicians. The government pays the insurance. It is the insurer. And it controls everything. So that's what we might call sort of a, 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 pure, a purified, socialized system. So that's one model. And that is a model that one finds in the UK. But that is not the model in every European country. So for example, in France, France, you could actually, if you really stack it up to the US system, including all the things I talked about with Medicare and Medicaid and everything else and the employer sponsor system, the French system is arguably slightly more market oriented than our system. We think of France as this like, you know, evil, you know, cheese eating socialized country. It, you know, when it comes to healthcare, they're actually, you know, they're, they're arguably more market oriented than us. They have a universal system for everybody that covers basic healthcare. But then people are free to buy supplemental insurance on top of that to cover other things. And that's largely unregulated in a way that would never be possible in the US. So in certain ways, the French system is more market oriented. And the doctors have real complete latitude to do whatever they want in France in a way that they don't to the same degree here because of the way Medicare uh, regulates a lot of things. And then there are some European countries and some developed and countries in the developed world that are actually more market oriented than the US. So there's Switzerland. So in Switzerland, there is no government payer in the public option sense of the term. What the Swiss government does is similar to what the Affordable Care Act does for a certain slice of the population, which is there's a sliding scale of subsidies. If you're poor, you get completely subsidized. If you're middle class, you get a partial subsidy. If you're wealthy, you get no subsidy. To buy insurance on a regulated marketplace where the government defines the, the insur insurance plan has to cover X, Y, Z, and you choose among these various plans. And then you, know, you take that plan and you go get, you know, get care when you need it. And the Swiss have a lot of the things that conservatives fear government, universal coverage uh, won't have. So if you're, if you're Swiss and you get sick, wait times for uh, surgical, uh, surgical procedures or doctor's appointments is as good as the US. Access to technology, as good as the US. So all the things that the conservatives worry about with universal care Actually, the Swiss do very well. Now, it's not a completely free market system, right? Because it's the, the insurance plans are, are regulated. So the government is saying what the insurance plan must cover. The Swiss system also involves uh, a certain amount of regulation for what hospitals can charge. So I don't know if you read the Steve Brill piece in Time, the 26,000 word piece, about all the things that hospitals do to kind of cheat. Uh, so the Swiss system heavily regulates that, much more aggressively than the US does. So it's not, you know, it's not a, you know, a free market utopia. But is it more market oriented in the US? Absolutely. Then there's Singapore. Now Singapore is about as close as to a free market utopia. It's not a free market either. But it's, it, within the developed world, it is the most market oriented system. So in, Switzerland, in, in Singapore, what they do is they have single payer coverage for catastrophic care. So if you get hit by a bus, you have a stroke, there's a single payer system that covers that. Medicare for all, you might say. But for everything else, there's this universal system of health savings accounts. So the way it works in Singapore, is there's a 20% payroll tax, kind of like our social security tax, but instead of going to social security, that money goes into a health savings account. So now you have a government mandated savings account, which you control, which you can then save over time and use for your routine health expenditures, your non-acute healthcare expenditures. So when you go to the doctor for your checkups, when you uh, go to get your diabetes treated, a lot of that's being driven by your health savings account. So under that system, What's attractive about that is it, 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 you know, it really does drive some of these or, or implement some of these uh, market-oriented ideas, which is that if you have a health savings account, you're not, you're not wasting the money because it's your money. If you don't spend it, that's money you can save for your health care later on. And it also rewards you for being healthy. Because if you're healthy and you don't have a lot of, uh, if, if you exercise, you, know, you work hard, things like that, you, know, you work out of the gym and you're, 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 you have less of those problems, then that's, that money accrues to you instead of having it spent on insulin treatments or going to the doctor all the time. So there's a lot more economic incentive in the, in the Singaporean system uh, to, to, uh, to take care of your own health in a way that isn't true when everything's paid for by somebody else. And it's important to remember, so we talk a lot again, it's not just that there's the US, which is the free market system, and the Europeans, which are the socialized people. You know, there's all this talk about how much we spend on healthcare versus them. We spend much more in the US on healthcare than the Europeans. And yet we don't have the hot same life expectancy that the Europeans have, right? Well, Singapore and Switzerland have among the highest life expectancies in the world. Switzerland has the highest life expectancy in the developed world. Now, life expectancy is not in any way 
the most appropriate way to measure the success of a health healthcare system. There are a lot of things that go into life expectancy other than uh, the quality of your healthcare system. Uh, having said that, if, if, to the degree people use that argument, it's not actually being accurately used because these two countries are just as wealthy as the U.S. and have higher life expectancies than a lot of the countries that, like the U.K., that uh, that progressives might otherwise use as a model for what our healthcare system should look like. So here's another chart I'd like to send to the conservatives, which is, okay, you think America has this free market healthcare system? Well, did you know that U.S. government entities per capita spend more on healthcare than all but two other countries in the entire world? So, you know, it's that red, it's that red bar right there. It's, it's, it looks four, so you think, why am I saying two? Well, Luxembourg, the state is one year old. So if, you, if Luxembourg goes to 2010, or, or if Luxembourg, uh, you know, moves to 2010, then the U.S. actually, because of the way the inflation works, U.S. would actually be higher. So these are the U.S., the only countries that really beat the U.S. on per, per capita public spending on health care are Norway and the Netherlands. So we're much higher than Germany. So we're, we're spent spending about 4000 bucks a year per capita, the government is, on health care. Canada, 3158 France, 3061 UK, 2857 But look at the bottom of the chart. Switzerland, 1628 Singapore, 762 so remember, Singapore is a wealthier country than the United States. It has higher life expectancy than the United States. It has universal coverage. And it spends $762 per capita on health care compared to $3,967 in the United States. Right? So yes, it's true the United States is inefficient. But it's also true that market-oriented systems can reduce costs. Now, a lot of progressives say, well, who cares about how much the government spends? Let's talk about overall spending on health care, both public and private, because that really is what matters. Now, I don't agree with that, but that's what progressives say. So on that, the U.S. is way out in front. Uh, health expenditures per capita as a percentage of GDP per capita, the U.S. spends 17.1%. So an enormous amount of our resources, every dollar that goes into the U.S. economy is being spent on health care. Switzerland, uh, on that total expenditure basis is well within the mainstream of Europe, kind of in the middle, because a lot of uh, healthcare expenditure in Switzerland is private rather than public or government driven. So it's in the middle. So here again, Canada's 11%, Switzerland's at 10.3%, UK's at 9.6%. So kind of in the middle, well within the mainstream. So this market oriented system that the Swiss have does pretty much the same within the same range as all these European countries that, again, progressives might think of as more of a model. But look at Singapore, way down here at the bottom, 2.5%. That's total health expenditures per capita in Switzerland, 2.5% of GDP compared to 17.1% for the United States. They're doing four times better than the typical Western European country on cost efficiency. So just think about that, right? So the argument that markets are uh, less cost efficient than, than socialized systems isn't true. Actually, the two most market-oriented systems in the developed world are Switzerland and Singapore. Switzerland's kind of in the mainstream of Europe. Singapore way outside of it on the better end. So this is the point. It's easy to waste other people's money. If it's your money, you're going to spend it more wisely. That's what the Singaporeans do. And that's why health savings accounts are really a powerful instrument for delivering care in a way that's cost efficient. Now, there are some things that you have to keep in mind. So we see this actually in our own experience. Let's just first talk about the top, top end of this, uh, this, this, uh, this slide. So one thing I like to talk about when it comes to HSAs and why they work is it's like a cash bar versus an open bar. You know, if you go to a cash bar, maybe you get the house wine or the house beer or the bud or whatever it is. If it's an open bar, especially if it's someone you don't know well, maybe if it's a friend, you might be more considerate. But, you know, we're more likely to order like the nice single malt scotch, right? Because somebody else is paying for it. Um, and, and that's kind of how we think about healthcare to a large degree. If we look at the aspects of the healthcare system in the U.S. where we pay out of pocket, we see, these, we see these efficiencies. So for LASIK surgery, the price of LASIK surgery keeps going down, not up. We, we hear all the time in health policy circles that technology is a big driver of health spending because there's more drugs and more therapies and more treatments, and that just keeps increasing the cost of healthcare. Well, if you look at LASIK, that's not how it works. In LASIK, the technology keeps getting better, and the prices keep coming down, just like they do in other sectors of the economy. Why is that? Because LASIK is like other sectors of the economy. People pay for it themselves, not with insurance. And there's maximum 
financial and personal, personal flexibility and choice. And what, what, I, what do I mean by that? So instead of having that $25,000 out of your paycheck that's being directed to an insurance plan, maybe you really only need a $10,000 insurance plan. And that $15,000 can go for other things. But you don't have that choice, whether you're on employer-sponsored insurance or government-sponsored insurance, because the way our system is set up is it forcibly redirects your dollars away from other productive purposes into healthcare for reasons that don't always make sense. Now, there are criticisms of HSAs. Some people argue that uh, Americans are not competent to make their own health care decisions, or at least not all Americans will. That some Americans will neglect their health. That they will forego necessary treatments or preventive care uh, in order to save that money. And that is an important thing to consider. And if you look at actually uh, all the studies uh, of health savings accounts, they show uh, some, some that criticism is somewhat accurate, but not really, which is to say that, that people actually who have HSAs are very engaged in their own care. And so they actually are sometimes more likely to do some of the preventive things that they should do. However, there are some economic incentives to forego certain types of treatments. And so what you might call HSAs 2.0, or the new generation of HSAs, take that into account by offering first dollar coverage for certain preventive services that history shows people tend to forego with a, with a more kind of pure HSA. So there are ways to tweak HSAs technically to improve, uh, the addre you know, to address that problem. But, but HSAs still have this very powerful economic impact on making sure that people don't waste money. So here's something else I want to talk about, which is, you know, we talked about overall health care spending per capita in all these countries, right? The other important thing to talk about is the growth of health care. So one thing you hear all the time in the U.S. is, well, if we just adopted X, if we just adopted the ACA or whatever health policy program is your pet program, then we'd bend the cost curve. We're going to lower the cost of health care, right? Well, so let's look at the growth in uh, health expenditures in other countries. It turns out that uh, there isn't much of a trend. So this green is the U.S. You see sort of it goes up, and then this is percentage rate and annual growth. It goes up, and then it kind of starts to come down. There have been a lot of headlines in the newspapers. Oh, well, we've solved the health care cost growth problem. Health care costs are going down. Well, if you look at these other countries, they're all going down too. What is this? This is the recession, right? So Switzerland, costs went down. UK is the blue, costs went down. Black is Canada, costs went down. So a lot of that's being driven by the recession. A lot of people are just, because of whatever's going on in their own lives, they're not seeking out care. Maybe they're afraid that they're going to get stuck with some of the copay or the deductible, and so that's inhibiting them from consuming as much care as they used to. And so health expenditures are going down. But if you look at these other countries, you look at the single-payer models of the UK and Canada, the more market-oriented system of Switzerland, and the hybrid system of the US, there's no obvious trend in the growth of national health expenditures over the last 15 years. So this idea that we have that, well, we're the only ones whose costs are growing, but everyone else is doing such a bang up job of managing the growth of health expenditures, completely untrue. So why is it that we spend so much on health care? You know, yes, from a growth standpoint, you know, we're not doing great, but we are a huge outlier in terms of uh, how much we spend relative to other countries. So why is that? And I would argue that it's because of this hybrid mixed system in which all these parts don't talk to each other and it creates enormous incentives for waste. So what happens in America? So in 1965, LBJ, through all the complex maneuverings that we heard about earlier, managed to say, let's, let's subsidize uh, health care for, uh, for old people and for some low-income people because they need it. So we did that. And the bean counter said, well, this would be just fine. It would cost only $10 billion in 1990. But what happened? Well, you have all this money going into health care. People all of a sudden have health coverage. What are they going to do? They're going to go to the doctor more. You know, when your doctor says, hey, let's, let's do an MRI scan. You don't really need an x-ray. An MRI is really going to do the job for you. Well, the, the guy says, sure, OK, fine, I'll have an MRI. Whatever it is. Oh, maybe you need this really elaborate procedure, this really fancy new technology we got. OK, fine. Uh, there's no incentive from the consumer to be concerned because they're not paying for it. What happens? Hospitals expand to reflect this massively increased demand. So all over the country, you know, even in this recession we're having, what are the brand new buildings that are being built all over the country? It's hospital wings. Because hospitals are making enormous amounts of money off all this government money that's flowing through the system. Right? So what happens? The bean counters wake up one day and they realize that the government's spending more than they expected. I don't know why. Uh, and so then the government says, well, we've got to do something about this. How do we 
spend less money on health care because it's driving the budget deficit like we saw earlier. Well, we'll get managed care involved. We'll get these insurers involved and we'll give them some sort of economic incentive to uh, manipulate the system in certain ways to um, negotiate better pricing structures with hospitals uh, and negotiate lower payments. And we'll also cut payments to hospitals. So we'll have the system of price control. We'll say, no, hospital, you're cheating us on how much you charge for this. So we're going to require that you charge this. And then that's where we're going to save money that way. The problem is, as again the Steve Brill article uh, highlights, is that hospital billing is so complicated that hospital, it's, a lot, it's pretty easy for hospitals and physicians to game the, the regimented system that comes out of Washington in ways that still maximize their income, one way or the other. It's not the most efficient way to do it, but they find a way. So the problem has been relatively intractable to provider cuts. And another thing that hospitals do is they say, well, OK, if the government's going to give us a hard time, well, that's one thing because we can't, you know, we can't negotiate with the government. But we can negotiate with private insurers. So we're going to merge. So all over the country, there's been a huge wave of hospital mergers. And so what does that do? Hospital mergers give hospitals in a particular part of the country huge negotiating power with, with insurers. So for example, in Boston, the two big hospitals associated with Harvard Medical School, the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, merged. What happened? They immediately started jacking up prices. And now the top four health insurance companies in Massachusetts are all nonprofits. And they, but they all said, look, you know, if we, we, can't, if we tell our uh, beneficiaries that you're not going to be able to get care from Mass General and Brigham and Women's, we'll lose business. They'll go to our competitors. And so what's now called Partners Healthcare, the, this, big, uh, this big behemoth that controls most of the, the big hospitals in Massachusetts, has effectively dictatorial power to dictate whatever prices they want because the insurers can't say no. Because if, if they do say no, then they're paying it as the bad guys, not the hospitals. And that's a, a big problem with the sort of the demonization of insurers is that we've missed the real problem, which is that hospitals are the ones driving the increased costs, not the insurers. So hospitals charge more to private insurers. Private insurers, of course, don't want to go bankrupt, so they raise their premiums to reflect these higher costs, which makes health premiums higher and less affordable to people. So less people have insurance because they can't afford it because it's too expensive. And then we wake up one day and say, you know what? Health insurance is too expensive, so let's subsidize it so more people can afford health insurance. And this is the healthcare system of the United States in one chart. So don't anyone ever, ever tell you that the healthcare system is too complex, because this is basically all it is. It's the government subsidizing an inefficient system in which hospitals have all the power. This is an old chart. The data is about 10 years old. But what this chart measures is this dark line is the number of hospital mergers. And there's been another wave here in the last 10 years. This, you know, 2003 is where this chart ends. And this light green line is market concentration. So if you look at other sectors of the economy, like the airline industry, when two airlines want to merge, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice get together and say, or one or the other, and say, uh, is this going to create too much of a, an oligopoly in the airline industry? And they measure that in a specific way. So these two economists, Herfindahl and Hirschman, created this index of market concentration, where you take uh, the number of players and add up the market share they have. And so if there's monopoly, that's one player with 100% market share. If there's two players with 50% market share each, that's like less concentrated and goes on and on. So 2,500 on this chart represents two players at 50% each. So because 50 times 50 is uh, 2,500. So that's, that's what the index measures. 1,500 is normally where the FTC and the DOJ get involved. So in the airline industry, when Continental wants to merge with United, or whatever, you know, I think the merger this time was American and US Airways. So what they do is they say, if, if, if the herfindahl hirschman index for the industry is above 1,500, we're going to file a lawsuit, an antitrust lawsuit, to prevent that merger from happening. And they usually win. But when it comes to hospitals, the FTC and the DOJ don't get involved unless it's above 2,500. So in every other sector of the economy, it's 1,500, according to the government. That's unacceptable. With hospitals, it's 2,500. And now this line here, it says it's below. As of 2013, the median hospital market in the United States has an HHI, a herfindahl hirschman index, of over 2,500. So that means, in theory, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice should be filing antitrust litigation against more than half the hospital markets in the United States. So why isn't it doing that? Because they lose in court. 
because courts have been uh, swayed by the argument that hospitals are the people who are saving lives. They're doing all the hard work. They're often nonprofits, right? And that, that blind spot has prevented people from realizing that hospitals are actually monopolies that are exploiting our healthcare system and driving a large part of the problem with cost and inefficiency. So what can be done about this? There's a couple things that can be done about this. One approach is what progressives argue, which is let's have Medicare for all. Because if you have a single payer system, then hospitals don't have market leverage. Because then the government comes and says, sorry guys, we're paying you $4,000 for the knee replacement, take it or leave it. And the hospitals have to cave. So that is one approach. You can have what's called a monopsony, which is a single, uh, single buyer, a single purchaser. And if you do that, you can win. So that is one approach to address this problem of hospital monopolies. You can also have private insurance monopsony. So if there's only one insurance company in a particular state or controls most of the market, and that's true in some states in the United States, then that insurer has a lot of the ability to negotiate with hospitals the same way that Medicare might. And that is, in fact, why you're seeing more and more of these insurance monopolies in given states, because that gives them the power to negotiate with these hospital monopolies on the other side. Now, there's another way to do this, which is to break up the hospital monopolies, right? So monopoly against monopsony is one way to do it, but why not have a system where there's more choice and more competition? Why not have a system where hospitals are competing with one another? Break up the hospital monopolies, encourage entrepreneurs to come in and build new hospitals, and that's something that's regulated by the government through certificate, need, certificate of need laws, usually at the state level. Facilitate medical tourism and telemedicine. So if you've got a, 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 so a radiologist in Montana who's doing a great job, who's a world-class radiologist, why not send your scans to that guy and let him do them all? You know, there's no reason why that can't be done except there's licensure barriers to do that in America. So it's, it's something that we could do if we fixed some of the laws around state, just interstate commerce when it comes to uh, the, the, the service, uh, you know, the, the, the provision of healthcare services. Price controls are, are what a lot of countries do, including the market models I mentioned, Switzerland and Singapore. But it's a blunt and inefficient tool because physicians and hospitals know their way around the regulations and can find ways to game the system. So from, from a, a, a political and a policy standpoint, particularly in the United States, where we're used to having enormous amounts of choice in all areas of the economy, except healthcare. So Americans are naturally suited to more competition, both in terms of insurance plans and hospitals. But to do that, we have to be much more aggressive at breaking up these hospital monopolies. So let me talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. So what, why, what, what are some of the things that are important to understand about the Affordable Care Act? And the, the first thing I would mention, actually the most important thing I'll mention, this is really my only slide about the ASA specifically in this talk, is that health insurance is not the same thing as health care. So the progressive goal for 100 years, as we've heard, is to expand coverage, to have universal coverage. So the, the progressive, progressive movement pays a lot of attention to that. How do we expand coverage? These statistics are thrown out all the time. Well, the ACA expands coverage by this much. This policy would decrease coverage by this much. This policy would expand coverage by this much. There's a lot less attention paid to the quality of that coverage. Just because you have a piece of paper that says you have health insurance doesn't mean that you actually are getting quality health care. So what is this chart over here? So this chart is looking at the percentage of physicians who accept no new patients by insurance status. So the reason why this is important is that if you look at private insurance, Medicaid, or Medicare and Medicaid, which are the three big modalities of insurance in the United States, they pay doctors at different amounts. So commercial uh, insurance, private insurance pays doctors at one amount. Medicare pays doctors at about 70% of that on average. It varies quite widely state to state. And Medicaid pays doctors even less. Again, in certain states, it's not such a big problem. But in large states in particular, like Florida, like California, like New York, like New Jersey, it's a huge problem. In New Jersey, for example, uh, Medicaid pays a, the primary care physician 29 cents for every dollar that a, a private insurer pays for, to care for a patient. So if you're a physician and you've got a choice between you know, which patients you want to take into your practice, which patients are you going to take? The ones that pay you a dollar or the ones that pay you 29 cents? You're going to take the ones that pay you a dollar. And so what happens? If you have private insurance, very few uh, patients are rejected for appointments, for care. If you're on Medicare, increasingly more and more patients are rejected. So more and more doctors are saying, no, I'm not going to take your insurance. So this left column, I know this is a busy slide and it's really small, I apologize for that. 
It's all physicians on the left, then it's internal medicine, family and general practice, pediatrics, medical specialties, psychiatry, surgical specialties, and OBGYN. So you can see here again, for private, if you have private insurance, it's, you're fine. Almost nobody rejects your insurance. But if you have Medicare, more and more people are starting to. And if you have Medicaid, it's even worse. So a lot of people who have Medicaid, who have this card that says, we've given you health insurance, can't actually get a doctor's appointment. And if you can't get a doctor's appointment, then your cancer doesn't get diagnosed until it's too late. Your heart disease doesn't get diagnosed until it's too late. And so you suffer from more strokes, more heart attacks, from more metastatic rather than benign cancer. And so you die sooner. So the point is, just because you have coverage doesn't mean you're getting good coverage and access to care. And the biggest problem with the Affordable Care Act is that it doubles down on that system of underpaying physicians, giving them poor access to care in a way that isn't going to lead to better health outcomes. And the reason why that was done was because Medicaid is cheaper. So again, it goes back to the fiscal problems, right? Because we spend so much money already on health care, if you're going to expand coverage, you have to do so in the most fiscally cheap way. And the cheapest way to expand coverage is Medicaid, because Medicaid pays doctors and hospitals less. So it costs less money per person to cover someone with Medicaid than it does on private insurance. So, for example, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that for the typical new patient that's going to be covered under the ACA on Medicaid, it's going to cost $6,000 per beneficiary per year. It's going to cost $9,000, 50% more, to cover that same person on the ACA exchanges, because the ACA exchanges are going to pay more to doctors and hospitals. So a lot of people then look at that and say, well, Medicaid's more efficient. It's kind of like saying a cell phone is more efficient if it doesn't have a battery or an antenna. Yeah, it might be cheaper if it doesn't have a battery or an antenna, but if you can't make a phone call, it's not efficient, right? A car without an engine is cheaper, but it's not more efficient. Medicaid, if it doesn't pay doctors enough for people to see you when, you, when you're sick, it's not more efficient. It's worse. Sometimes spending more money is actually more efficient. And then another point. So one thing you hear a lot about with single payer. So if we really care about uh, uh, cost efficiency, why not go with single payer? Uh, a common uh, thing you hear a lot in the health policy world is Medicare is more efficient. It has lower administrative costs than private insurance. But as we saw in those big charts where I compared spending in the different countries, that isn't belied by the data, right? So the single payer countries like the UK and Canada, they do less in the US, but market oriented countries like Switzerland and Singapore are also competitive on those metrics. So, so what are we missing? And the important thing to understand is that when we look at administrative costs with Medicare, we're missing a number of important elements. One is that because the program is run by the government, there are other government agencies that are involved in administering the Medicare program. So the IRS collects taxes that fund the Medicare program. Medicare doesn't have to do that. So, and another thing is that Medicare population is older, so they're sicker, so they consume more care. So administrative costs is an equation. The equation is how much do we spend on overhead, employees to look at claims and things like that, and how much are we spending on health care? Well, of course, the older population, we spend a lot more on health care than the younger population because they're older and sicker. So the denominator is really large. And that's why the numerator next to the denominator looks small. But in a younger, healthier population where the denominator is small, yes, as a percentage, we're spending more on administrative costs on that population. But actually, on a per beneficiary basis, we're spending less. So that's what this chart illustrates. So the orange is private insurance. And the blue is Medicare. And this dark blue is the amount you're actually spending on health care. So you're spending a lot more on health care for Medicare people than you are for people on private insurance, because private insurance, people on private insurance are younger. But the actual amount that's being spent on health care, on, on administrative costs, is higher on Medicare. So in 2005, so this is an old chart, but the data still holds. In 2005, Medicare spent $509 per beneficiary on administrative costs. Private insurers spent 453 and that's despite all of the economies of scale and other uh, eff efficiencies through the IRS and other things that Medicare has. There's also a lot more fraud in Medicare. So there's about uh, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, estimates that at least 10% of Medicare spending is waste and fraud. Whereas with private insurers, it tends to be low single digits. Because private insurers hire people whose sole job it is is to hassle you when you do something, when your doctor does something that's mildly wasteful and inappropriate. And we don't like that. We don't like it when insurers hassle our doctors and our hospitals, but that's why they do it, to save money. The government does not do that, and so the government spends more money. 
It's kind of like saying a bank is more efficient if it doesn't have security guards. Yeah, great, they save money on the employees for the security guards, but they might get robbed more often. That's not necessarily more efficient. So that's an, these are important considerations to think about when we think about this, this chart, this idea of administrative costs being low for Medicare, which is a big talking point as to why Medicare is supposedly, but not actually, more efficient than private insurance. So what can we do in the United States? The thing that where liberals are actually right is that you know, one, one thing that Democrats complained about all throughout the debate about Obamacare was we're taking a Republican idea, these exchanges, it's a Republican idea, it was Mitt Romney. Why aren't conservatives supporting this? And the reason why is because it was additional spending on top of the existing system without really reforming the existing system. But having said that, the exchanges do offer us an avenue for reform. I think the exchanges, they're, they're not ideally designed, and there are some flaws in the way the ACA exchanges were designed. We can talk about in the discussion session uh, if you like. But overall, exchanges are not a terrible way to deliver health care. As we've seen, Switzerland uses exchanges and does reasonably well with it. Now, the Swiss system isn't perfect. The Singaporean system is, from my standpoint, more ideal. But would I take that over the American system? Absolutely. Now, it's also important to remember the Paul Ryan plan for Medicare is exactly the same. So it's not just Republicans who are being hypocritical with Democrats. So every Democrat who said that the Paul Ryan plan for Medicare is this evil thing has to explain why they think it's all right for 64-year-olds who uh, live at the poverty line to have exactly the same kind of insurance. So it's OK to be poor in 64 and have Swiss-type insurance on the exchanges, according to the Affordable Care Act, which all Democrats voted for, mostly. But it's terrible if wealthy seniors have the same kind of insurance. That's what the Democrats are arguing. And what the Republicans are arguing is that Paul Ryan's plan is great, but Obamacare is really terrible because these exchanges are really terrible. So both sides are actually being intellectually inconsistent. The fact is, the Paul Ryan plan is actually slightly to the left of the ACA exchanges. The Paul Ryan plan contains a public option. The, the ACA exchanges do not. It's only private insurers. The ACA plan is a sliding scale of subsidies that taps out at 400% of poverty. So if you're wealthier than 400% of poverty, you get no subsidy. If you're between 100% and 400, you get some subsidy, again, on the sliding scale. The Paul Ryan plan subsidizes everybody, whether you're poor or you're rich. You still get Medicare, thanks to the taxpayer. So it's a much more means-tested system. It's much more redistributive. It distributes more money to the poor, uh, but in a way that's much more cost-efficient. The Paul Ryan plan spends money on everybody. So if we actually took, instead, if we dropped the Paul Ryan plan and gradually migrated everyone uh, in, in, the, in the senior population, the retiree population, to the ACA exchanges, we'd save an enormous amount of money because that top quartile of, of retirees who make more than 400% of FPL would no longer be on Medicare. They'd get no subsidy at all, and that's how it should be. We should be subsidizing the people who actually need the money as opposed to the people who don't. And then we could take that same amount of money and spend it more on the poor. So we could put the Medicaid population on the exchanges. And, if we, and it's going to cost more money to do that because the exchanges cost more than Medicaid. But we can take the savings from not subsidizing health care for rich seniors and use that to help poor people get better health care. And, and it's very simple to do that. All you do is raise the retirement age of Medicare. Right? If you raise the retirement age of Medicare gradually over time, what happens? 65-year-olds, 66-year-olds, 67-year-olds gradually go on the ACA exchanges because that's now the system that's in place as a safety net for those individuals. And again, you can use those savings to, uh, to expand the Medicaid program or expand the exchanges into the Medicaid pool, which is also kind of already happening due to some things that are going on in some states uh, that are negotiating with the Obama administration today. So the argument that I've made, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, Douglas Holtz Eakin, the former director of the Congressional Budget Office in the Bush administration, and who was also an advisor to McCain, and I put out an op-ed in Reuters a couple weeks ago, we, we articulated this, that, well, this is what we should do, that conservatives should drop the whole let's repeal Obamacare uh, approach and instead say, you know what? The ACA exchanges are, are, it's true, Democrats are right. The ACA exchanges are a market-oriented mechanism for delivering health insurance to lower-income people, and we can actually reform the entitlement system entirely by using this democratic law, which was supported entirely by Democrats and not Republicans, and use that to reform Medicare and Medicaid and put the entire system in one bucket where everyone's in the same system more efficiently in a way that actually spends a lot less money than we do today. So 
that's my plan for universal coverage, and that's why I think conservatives should care about universal coverage. And I think it's also a plan that it will be hard for Democrats to resist, because if, uh, if a liberal Democrat who supported the ACA says, well, it's really terrible that 65-year-olds will go on the exchange, I said, well, why do you think it's good for 64-year-olds to be on the exchange? You supported it. You voted for it. Um, and, and so I think that at least there's going to be some, and it's also because it's more redistributive, right? Because this is a way to get better health care to the poor. So I, I think it's something that while, you know, it's very easy to say, well, I'm a Republican, I'm giving this plan, so it's, you know, the instinctive thing is to not trust it and to oppose it. What I'm really arguing for is let's stop subsidizing health care for rich seniors and let's subsidize more health care for poor individuals. And I don't think that's so terrible. And I actually think that's not just something that progressives should agree to, but conservatives, because overall, if we do that, we'll spend less money than we spend today. And we might eventually have a health care system that spends what Switzerland spends rather than what the United States spends on health care. So those are my uh, remarks, and I look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Well, I introduced our speakers, uh, but I, you weren't seeing them when I introduced it. This is Mark Hall to my left and Tom Roberts uh, to his left. Um, thank you, Abic. That was very persuasive, I think. <laughs> and we'll see how persuasive it was with Mark and Tom here. But I think the first thing is just let's just talk about your thesis, right? And if I have your thesis right, your arguing is that the individualistic market sort of uh, approach hasn't been tried and found wanting. It just hasn't been tried. And I think we're all in agreement. One of the things I've learned here today is we've got this inefficient, ineffective system, and you've offered us a, a way to, to, you know, to correct that. And so let, let's see what you know, Mark and Tom has to say. Has the market approach just not been tried? And, and, uh, and maybe react to some of the more general parts of of Ovik's thesis, if I had it right. Go ahead, Mark. Me first? OK, sure. well, I, I agree. Very convincing and, and an excellent coverage uh, of the landscape. Um, and um, I'm almost tempted to agree, but I, I just <laughs> can't uh, uh, come to that. Uh, so here's a couple of the problems I was left with. First of all, you know, the convincing explanation of why too much insurance is bad and, and, and keeps the market from functioning the way it should. Uh, someone who's starting premise is that I, I just don't think they're going to come through with universal coverage. If, you're, if your starting premise is more insurance is bad, why are you motivated to expand insurance and, and particularly? So, so that's, you know, I never quite got to the point of hearing the proposal that either Paul Ryan has or that you have to produce the funding that would uh, yield uh, universal coverage. So I, I just don't quite trust that the, 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 the end point is going to be there, that, that, that the goal is going to be at the end of the rainbow, that, 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 that uh, this is a, a body of thought that's going to lead us to the point that, that, uh, that, that the Obama administration failed to get to. The, the second is, I think, in terms of um, the, 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 our experience with market mechanisms, um, there are lots and lots of problems with the market. And I think you have lots of great ideas about uh, how to improve uh, the market. Uh, hospital pricing is one of the big things, um, uh, and, and, um, and, and certainly the way in which insurance is structured is a big sort of root uh, cause of that problem. But on the other hand, we do have health savings accounts. So there's nothing that sort of health savings accounts uh, is somehow opposed to uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, it's part of the law. We have it. We've got five or ten years' experience with it. And most of that experience tells us that they don't sort of you know, produce this sort of magical transformation in the markets that we'd like to see. Um, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking, uh, you know, on both sides of the ideological spectrum on this, that somehow government regulated prices would do a better job or that more pure market driven prices would do a better job. I think the pricing issue is, is, a, is, a, is a big problem. I mean, is, is, is sort of a, a real, uh, uh, not of a problem that, that, that for which there's no, no easy solution, but I think we have enough experience with some of these mechanisms to say that some kind of wholesale uh, adoption of them uh, isn't going to be the, the sort of um, silver bullet solution. So, If you don't mind, we'll let Tom, and then maybe you can keep track and respond. 
Well, um, first off, I, I just want to say it's uh, great to be able to uh, have an intelligent conversation with a conservative uh, because uh, <laughs> we, we, have, we have not had those conversations. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at our legislature right now, uh, especially around Medicaid expansion, uh, those conversations are just absolutely not taking place. I mean, you can't sit down with a conservative legislator in uh, Montana right now and have a conversation about how do we provide health care uh, to Montanans. It's, it's really ideological based. And so um, it's very refreshing. Um, I, I must say that I'm sort of a pragmatist rather than a, a theorist. Uh, and uh, what we're about to see in Montana over the next uh, year is going to be very, very dramatic. Uh, with the uh, ACA uh, coming in, whether or not we expand Medicaid. And so uh, for 200,000 Montanans, maybe you should subtract about 50,000 uh, for Medicaid because uh, the issue of expansion uh, has not been resolved. And, and today it's looking a little dim in our legislature, I must say. Uh, but for another 150,000, uh, there's going to be the opportunity to get on to the exchange and to get health care. And so uh, I think that uh, we're going to find out whether market-driven uh, health care works. And it's going to be a very different um, insurance uh, market here in Montana as well as the rest of the country. Um, when you go on the exchange and buy your insurance, you're going to get uh, regular insurance. It's not going to be under insurance. You don't have to worry about uh, reaching your limit. Uh, you know, there will be some deductibles and co-pays. But up to 250% of federal poverty level, uh, those co-pays and deductibles are actually going to be um, helped to be paid. So we are really going to be subsidizing insurance for a huge number of people. Those are not only going to be the uninsured people. There's a lot of uh, small businesses in Montana. Um, you know, I think 87% of business, 97% of businesses in Montana have less than 50 employees. There's no penalty for those small employers to drop health insurance. So the other thing that we're going to see is that I think a lot of uh, small employers are going to say, guess what, it's cheaper for me to pay you money to go onto the exchange to buy an insurance product, a good insurance product, by the way, and you'll be able to afford insurance. So, you know, I think the discussion, is it, is it reasonable to put elders on there or Medicaid on there? I'm going to be willing to have that discussion. But we're going to see dramatic changes because of the ACA. And, and I think most of us don't really understand that. So we're going to get a chance to see whether uh, market, uh, consumer-driven market, because there's going to be individuals on the market buying it, uh, are going to make a difference in costs. So my first Would point. you like to? Yeah. So. Uh, um, the first uh, question was on, is there, is there a genuine political interest among Republicans in, in achieving universal coverage? And look, I'm in the minority. I mean, I, you know, this is, my position is not one that's shared by everyone. Uh, when Doug, uh, Doug Holtzikin and I put out that op-ed, it, it got some criticism from the right, um, but also some support. And I, I think actually when I, when I talk to people in, uh, in Washington, which I do quite a bit, uh, both in Congress and in the think tank and activist world, what I hear a lot of now is uh, intrigue with this idea. Because again, the, it's not that conservatives hate poor people. They're just concerned about the spending problem. And so if there's a way to actually cover everyone but do so at a lower cost, that's something that intrigues people, particularly given that repeal is not going to happen. You know, no one wants to admit that right now, because if they do, they'll get primaried. But the fact is, if you talk to people off the record, on background, they, they, they understand the, the, the reality of what's going on. And I think most people understand that not everyone agrees, but most people agree, I'd say, that by the time 2016 comes around, the Republican nominee for president is not going to be campaigning to repeal Obamacare, but will have to come up with something else. And uh, if, if that is the case, if you're going to have to come up with something other than repealing Obamacare, because people are 15 million people, say, are getting coverage through the law at that point, and you, you know, are you going to campaign on taking coverage away from those people? I don't think so. I think you've got to come up with something different. And so this approach is one that allows uh, a Republican presidential candidate in 2016 to say, you know what, I'm not trying to take away coverage from anyone. I'm just trying to increase the efficiency of the system by redirecting more money to the people who need it. So 
while I agree with you that's, that hasn't been the, the conservative policy priority up to this point, I, I think there's a plausible reason to believe that the, the logic of the situation, the political economy of the situation, uh, will encourage that outcome four years from now, three years from now. Uh, your point about HSAs, uh, yes, it's true that HSAs have not revolutionized the healthcare system today, but they have made a difference for the people who have them. So if you have a true HSA where you can save the money and roll it over to the next year, and not all so-called HSAs are like that. Some HSAs are what are called use it or lose it, where you get this pile of money, but then it goes away at the end of the year. And that's not a real HSA. The idea of an HSA is you can save for your health care in future years. And, and in those plans, actually, more and more people are migrating to them. So 13% of people have HSAs today where it was zero 10 years ago. The reason for that is because they're more cost efficient, because you can have lower premiums by having a higher deductible and, a, and, a, and an HSA. Part of the problem with the ACA is it requires a maximum deductible that's about half of what it was before. And so the idea is you have a high deductible on a health savings account, but if the deductible is really low, then the HSA really has not a significant role in, in creating the cost efficiencies. So that's one of the things that I, I would adjust if I were running the world is, is whatever you think of the ACA, uh, uh, create more of a room for a, a consumer-driven health plan that involves a higher deductible and an HSA. But you have to do other things too. You, it, create, you're, you have to have a tipping point whereby so many people have HSAs and are shopping for care for themselves that they, they demand the price transparency from physicians and from hospitals that we don't have today. There might be a role for government in mandating tri price transparency at the state level or at the federal level. So there are a lot of other policy adjustments that need to be made for HSAs to work. So in Singapore, for example, Hospitals are required to post their price, their average prices for their uh, most common procedures, and doctors are as well. So there are things that you can do that we don't do in America that help HSAs work better. Um, and then to your point about just the, the pragmatism and, and, well, let me just say that, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, whether conservatives are dumb or intelligent, uh, you know, I, I certainly... I certainly like to think that conservatives are intelligent and realistic, uh, but I think the, the real problem is not that conservatives are dumb when it comes to health care, it's that conservatives have not, it's not been a priority for conservatives. So if something is not a priority, you're just not going to be as knowledgeable about the issue. When I, you know, w with my blog, my Forbes blog, which is on health care and it's, you know, a right of center blog, I have as many liberal readers as I do conservatives because liberals care so much about health care, they're interested in what the, the crazy right wing guys are saying. So, so the, 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 but the conservatives are, are not as interested. It's, it's sort of on the periphery of the conservative movement. So that's a large part of the reason why a lot of Republican politicians are not as knowledgeable about health care because it's just not been a priority for them with their constituency, with their base, and what didn't, isn't what, what motivated them to go into politics. But, but my goal is to improve that to some degree. So Mark, you want to? Yeah, so I, I, I like the, the way the thinking is evolving because putting it out a, a good set of ideas that might catch hold four years from now and what have you uh, is, is, I think, a, a, a constructive thing. So let me see if I can kind of do a friendly amendment, so to speak, as we, you know. Uh, so uh, you're right. We have uh, sort of uh, from the left one set of ideas about how the socialized insurance side of things should work, which is bracketed with Medicare and Medicaid, uh, you know, on either end and then in the middle are these exchanges. Um, and we have a different set of attitudes about how those are supposed to work. So why not have them kind of all work more or less the same? Well, uh, on the liberal end, end of the spectrum, the, the solution to that would be a, a public option. So if you had an exchange structure that covered the whole population, but included in that a public option, which is essentially how we now have Medicare. Medicare has a, a, is, is a public plan with a private option. So you have public sector, private sector insurance, uh, you know, uh, competing side by side in Medicare. Um, uh, the, the private option for Medicare is called Medicare Advantage, and it's holding its own. Its, it's, it, it's, its membership has grown, um, and, and um, it, it's producing good evaluations in terms of quality of care, um, and, it's, and it's providing uh, better coverage, lower uh, deductibles and co-pays than, 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 the, than the public option. Uh, but the public option is also still doing well. So, I mean, there's some, you can see some uh, pros and cons. Now, on the question of administrative costs, I think that's the better measure uh, you can compute your denominators and numerators in various ways, but if you actually go head to head, you can get a true measure of administrative cost. And there, you do see that the that the Medicare uh, private plans uh, are running significantly higher administrative costs than the same set of benefits administered by the government. But that's that's an, that's an academic aside. Uh, but the point is, you get that real test. Now, um, uh, the point in the exchanges, of course, is that. Um, uh, a large segment of, of the insurance industry as well as a large uh, segment of, of, of the political uh, public policy 
uh, community uh, fought uh, tooth and nail to avoid any type of public option test. So, so as in the spirit of, of finding that middle ground, would you be willing to move to a universal exchange structure uh, in exchange for having a public option as part of that exchange structure? It's not my preference. Uh, <laughs> because we're almost we're close to a deal yeah, here. Obviously, yeah. as a free market guy, I prefer a, <laughs> you know, a less government intervention right. rather than more. Uh, and I would say that one thing that's important to understand about the public option is that uh, the government has ways to cheat. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of things like the way uh, government programs, uh, the accounting for a government program isn't necessarily the way private insurers are required to account for their finances. So there are things like that. If, if you could level the playing field administratively to make sure that the plans uh, that the government plan, the public option, was competing fairly with the private uh, plans in terms of uh, the way it accounted for its expenses, the way it paid claims, that it wasn't subject to any sort of political preference through the way it was set up, through the regulatory structure, through Congress, then that's fine. Let's, Let's give it away all the good stuff about government, though. I, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if accounting gives or what, what I would say was, is one of the well, good sure. things. But, but, you know, so that, so that's, I, I, you but know, I know it doesn't hurt me. Well, right. that's, that's yeah. the Paul Ryan plan, right? Yeah. So the Paul Ryan right. plan is exactly what you're talking about. It's, you know, it's, it's important. No, I meant the political favors. Right, but no, it's, it's, no. Important, it's important to make the, the distinction uh, between Medicare Advantage and the Paul Ryan plan. The reason why the Paul Ryan plan saves more money, in theory, than Medicare Advantage is because Medicare Advantage is required to offer the same benefits, and in fact, incentivized to offer more greater benefits than what the traditional Medicare uh, program does. And so, it, and, and the savings, any efficiencies are, that are created, are, 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 are plow, plow, flow into, plowed into more benefits, not savings to the taxpayer or to seniors. Uh, so, actually, the whole point of the, the, the Paul Ryan plan, or the Swiss type plan, or the ACA, is that the competitive dynamic leads people to have the incentive to. To, to shop for cheaper insurance because they pocket the savings if they buy a cheaper plan. So that incentive isn't there in Medicare, Medicare Advantage today, and that's why, though Medicare Advantage does have some efficiencies over the traditional Medicare program, it doesn't really drive efficiencies. You really have to give seniors the incentive where they're gonna save money themselves in order to uh, in, encourage uh, uh, more cost-efficient health insurance. So that's the, the, the deficiency of Medicare Advantage relative to a Swiss-style uh, approach. Tom, I, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that um, I, I've been very involved in uh, looking at the exchange in terms of uh, creating a new insurance product for Montana. I just want to get a plug in for the co-op, which is going to be member owned and, and directed. And our analysis is that uh, people, in fact, are going to be looking at the cheapest um, health insurance plan on the exchange. And they're going to save a lot of money by going to the cheapest health insurance. Now, it turns out that, of course, the people that choose the cheapest health insurance are going to be the ones that don't need health insurance, which, as we saw last night from uh, Jack Mudd, is 50% of the population uses, what, 3% of the health care services, and 10% of the population use 70%. So I think part of the problem that I see with, um, you know, with cost uh, basis uh, for insurance plans, as well as the health savings account, is that they really don't address that 10% that is using 70% of our healthcare services. And what we really need to focus on is not, you know, how do we create uh, health savings for somebody like me who is basically healthy. I mean, I have an HSA and I think it's great. What we really need to do is focus on that 10% and say, how can we provide better care to those people so that they don't spend 70%? And I would argue that our healthcare system has not done that. And that really what we need to focus on is not, you know, how we're paying for this, but how do we create efficiencies in terms of providing good medical care? So one last point before I shut up. It has to be through a primary care-based system. I mean, we cannot have a health care system like we do right now where 90% of the U.S. grads and over, probably 93%, are going into specialty medicine. Why do they go into specialty medicine? Because they pay, get paid more. And it's, you know, it's a better job if you're a specialist than if you're a primary care doctor. So we have created this very, very backward system, which we, we haven't really addressed here, which is based on hospitals, as you point out, putting money through hospitals, putting specialists into our system, and not focusing on primary care. So one of the things that, that I've been very excited about uh, in terms of medical developments is uh, how do we really start to emphasize primary care as we're developing our medical system. And, and my hope is that we can continue to develop ways to do that. Because I think if you put those chronically ill people in a place where they're being managed, where they're being looked at on an ongoing basis, where they have connection to people when they need help, 
then we're going to start to see real cost savings. It's not going to be by getting cost savings for that 50% that uses 3% of the health care. That's just not going to do it. So we need to reform the system. Does the ACA do that? No. But it, I think it begins to create mechanisms where we can start to see that kind of thing happen. So, so about 30% of national health expenditures are for acute care. So 70% is for non-acute care. So it, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, or at least we ought to aspire to walk and chew gum at the same time. One can look at acute care inefficiencies and waste in the way we treat people in hospital settings, but also provide more consumerism in the non-acute setting where people can shop for where they get their mammogram, where they get their checkup, where they get their knee replacement. So you can do both in theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's follow up on that a little bit. I mean, this was brought up in Jack Mudd's talk last night, and it almost seemed to be sort of the root of the problem that our healthcare system uh, is not really a healthcare system, but it is a fee for service on addressing sickness, right? And uh, you're reforming that particular system by moving it to a more market model, in a sense providing some rationalization to aim toward efficiencies, right? Um, does it, though, address that kind of problem? Is, uh, is, you know, healthcare is much more than sick care. It, we're, we're trying to getting at what Tom's talking about, getting at the root of the problem here. Well, and can we we're do not that even talking about the root of the problem right now, but I'd you know, be happy to take that lead. Um, uh, the, the Institute of Medicine recently came out with a report which looked at uh, health statistics in the U.S. and compared them to many of those other countries that you, you showed. And, uh, in fact, our health is much worse, um, you know, sort of across the board. Uh, but it's not just worse because we don't get the right health care. We also make bad choices about lifestyle. Uh, we drink more, we eat more, we have more diabetes, we exercise less, we don't wear seat belts, we own more guns. Um, you know, Jack pointed out last night that 3% of Americans uh, exercise 20 minutes a week, eat fruits and vegetables, uh, are normal in their BMI, and, and one other thing. I mean, you know, it's incredible what we do to ourselves. So, uh, and health is related to socioeconomic status, but even people who are wealthy and college educated do poorer in their health than comparable people in other countries. So it's not just our healthcare system, it's our, it's our choices that we make as a, as a social system. Um, and that's really what determines our health. The kind of healthcare system we choose reflects that, so that if we choose a market-based system that rewards specialists for doing cardiac stents, we're going to have a lot more cardiac stents. If we chose a health-based system that really was focused on healthcare, we could improve our healthcare. There's no question about that. That's what I would point out is uh, the root of the discussion about Medicaid. Um, if we expand Medicaid uh, and we cover these people that aren't uh, covered right now, we're not talking about versus private insurance or versus Medicare. We're talking about no insurance. And I, I know Ovik and I may disagree on this, but uh, I think it's very clear that any insurance is better than no insurance. So are we going to make the right choice in terms of creating a healthy state here or not? Uh, I, I think that's open to discussion. Do you guys want to pick up on this or go to something else? Yeah, I, I'll also just say two points. One, I think, I think you bring up a really important point, which is that health outcomes aren't entirely solvable through legislation. A lot of it is culture. A lot of it is food culture, the way we eat, what we eat, how much we exercise. You know, uh, so, so those things matter, and I think it's, it's important that we keep that in mind when we think, you know, when we think we're saving the world by giving people health insurance. That's, that's number one. And number two, I'd say that it's important to understand one of the big flaws in all of our discussions about healthcare policy and health economics mm -hmm. is that it's very difficult to measure time. So when you wait 11 months for the procedure versus four weeks, we don't really measure that. We don't measure the, the time the doctor spends sitting you down and saying, you know what, your diet is a complete mess, stop eating the pizza. Because a doctor isn't paid for telling you to stop eating the pizza. Uh, but maybe that's important because that's what's screwing up your diabetes. And one of the things that you're seeing a lot of now in, in, in modern primary care, contemporary primary care, is people leaving the insurance system or uh, re retracting themselves partially from the insurance system to do more what's called retainer services, or some people call it concierge medicine, where they take a $100 monthly fee from someone to be a true primary care physician, where uh, you actually can spend an hour uh, sitting with the patient, interviewing the patient, examining the patient, going through things like nutrition and diet. 
Um, and that's something you're going to see more and more of because it's actually not that expensive. 1200 bucks a year, I mean, I pay more than that for my cell phone contract, right? But if I'm getting better care that way, then uh, I might do that. And from a primary care physician, primary care physicians are underpaid in America relative to specialists. They can actually make a pretty healthy living uh, using the retainer model with, with, with less patient volume. So that if more prim primary care physicians do that, we exacerbate perhaps the doctor access shortage because you know there's less this doctor seeing thousands upon thousands of patients, but that's a whole other issue. Which we should have a lot more doctors in America, and that's both in terms of what we do with graduate medical education and what we do in terms of immigration. Uh, but we should have more doctors, and we should let doctors get a pay through a get be paid through retainer services where they're paid for their time and not for a procedure or a service. Well, you had some answers and conclusions to your talk, and I ask you to leave your slide up. So I was just wondering, it's over there, or yeah, whichever yeah. way you look. And maybe Mark, if you'd like, do you want to comment on some of these answers? Uh, the Swiss model and... Yeah, the yeah, so, model? well, I, I, let me bridge off the cultural factor. So we're a lot of what we're dealing with in terms of health versus health care is, is, is obviously deeply ingrained. Um, personal habits and, and sort of social expectations and, 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 and senses of responsibility and what have you. But you have to also remember that Singapore has a certain set of social, social and cultural uh, and behavioral uh, norms uh, that are deeply ingrained, and, and, and Switzerland does as well. So what worries me about sort of putting up a chart and saying, wouldn't it be nice if we could not take it out a few notches, is, is that we really uh, you know, have to work within the set of uh, you know, institutions, and I know you know this all too well. Um, so I mean, to say, well, gosh, it works in Singapore, therefore let's do it, is, is, is obviously the beginning of the conversation and not the end of the conversation. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, so thinking about you know, how well things actually work there, and, 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 and typically when one takes a deeper dive, uh, one begins to find sort of a number of problems or issues, and, and you alluded to these uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, Switzerland being much more sort of price regulatory uh, than, than you would be comfortable with, but that's part of what makes the formula I work. would take that trade. Yeah. I would taste that um, trade. They, they also have uh, pure community rating, the, the sort of anticipating a, a talk coming up later in the afternoon that, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, as, as opposed to the more uh, modified community rating that you would prefer, and other things that sort of they're comfortable with, everybody of the same age paying the same price, and uh, doctors and hospitals being essentially price regulated, uh, and, and certainly insurance rates uh, by the government and that sort of thing. So, so just sort of to uh, take it a next layer deeper, you, you acknowledge those are parts of the of the. They they are, and yeah. and I would advocate a.